All right. Well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today, I'm joined by Stephen Pfeiffer, who is an affiliate of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University, as well as a non-resident senior fellow with the Brookings Institution. In the past, Stephen was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, and the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia on the National Security Council. So, Ambassador Pfeiffer, thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So when did you first get interested in the Foreign Service? Uh, actually, it was in, when I was at college at Stanford. Um, I would kind of decided early on that I wanted to do uh, public service. Um, I spent um, two quarters of my sophomore year overseas at uh, Stanford's campus in Germany. Ah. Came back with that thinking I wanted to do uh, work that would involve the opportunity to live and work overseas. And then uh, Stanford at the time had a fairly interesting arms control program, several courses on arms control. I got very interested in that. And so when I looked at public service, live, work overseas, arms control, the Venn diagram sort of centered on the foreign service. Yeah, that's cool. OK. And so, you know, I guess earlier on in your career in the foreign service, you were at, at least at one point in the 90s working at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. That, that was in the 1980s. Yeah. Or I, 1980s. I, I, OK. Yeah, uh, normally foreign service officers, you tend to move around, but I had about a seven and a half year stretch where I worked primarily on arms control, first on the NATO desk at the State Department. Uh, and during that time, I spent uh, several rounds at the uh, negotiations on intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe. Uh, after that, I went to work for about a year and a half for Paul Nitze, who'd been one of the uh, chief American negotiators. And then I went to Embassy Moscow, where there was a specific slot for somebody to follow arms control issues. Uh, I thought it was the best job in the embassy. I mean, at that time, we had the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty being concluded. We had negotiations on strategic weapons. Um, I mean, the most of the Soviet Union was closed to American diplomats. Uh, in the two years, I think the uh, embassy got three closed area exceptions, and I got all three. Wow. To travel to places in, in connection with arms control areas. So that's fascinating. I mean, so. Obviously, if you were in there in the 80s, there's still a little bit of time before the Soviet Union would collapse. Um, you know, were you aware of the fact that that could happen at the time or? You know, I, I think a lot of us miss the fact just how um, fragile uh, yeah. and well the Soviet system was. So you could see the changes that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was making and I think he recognized that the system was not uh, going to allow the Soviet Union to compete uh, with the West. Right. But when he talked about perestroika and glasnost, you know, restructuring and openness, I mean, he was trying to, I think, develop a stronger economy. Uh, but also uh, inadvertently, I don't think it was his intention, he unleashed some forces where you saw this, the internal tensions within the Soviet Union uh, really eroded. Uh, mm -hmm. And you saw this in the nationalism expressed in the Baltic states and Ukraine, places like that, where this Soviet structure, which um, you know had been really imposed on people, uh, was not meeting what people had hoped for, uh, and was really you know basically could not survive on it. It sort of collapsed internally. Yeah. So I mean, you know, how concerned were you then, given that a lot of your work has has dealt with like arms control and such things, you know? How concerned were you when the Soviet Union broke up that you have, you know, the sort of dispersal of nuclear weapons? You have some in Ukraine. Obviously, Russia has some. You know, what were you thinking then? Well, I mean, one of the early focus, and this is, I think, the, the nuclear weapons question was very much at the top of the agenda for what was then the George H.W. Bush administration when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, I mean, you had strategic nuclear weapons in Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. Um, but you also had tactical nuclear weapons in, in, in even more of the now new independent states uh, that had once been part of the Soviet Union. Um, the Russians moved very quickly, and I'd say by the summer of 1992, so within six months of the, of the formal end of the Soviet Union, they had returned all of the tactical nuclear weapons to Russia. Uh, and sometimes it's not clear that they did that with any real coordination with the uh, country where those weapons were. Right. Uh, but it's still left the issue of the strategic nuclear weapons that were in Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine. Uh, six months before the collapse, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States had concluded the first strategic arms reductions treaty. Uh, now, of course, with the Soviet Union no longer in existence, so in May of 1992, you had the Lisbon Protocol, 
And in that document, Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and others basically agreed to take on the Soviet obligations uh, under the treaty. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Belarus also agreed that they would eliminate all nuclear uh, weapons on their territory. Uh, you know, get, eliminate the the missiles, the launchers, the bombers, um, and uh, transfer the warheads back to Russia for elimination. Yeah, so that's a that's good. I guess to a really fascinating aspect of that history, especially today. You know, what was the thought at the time of like Ukraine giving up their nuclear weapons to Russia? Yeah. Well, I, Ukraine was inclined from the beginning to be a non-nuclear weapon state. And part of that reflected the legacy of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident in sure. 1986. Um, but the Ukrainians, while they were inclined to get rid of the nuclear weapons, also said there were certain questions they had. You know, one question was, who was going to fund the elimination of the missiles and the bombers and the missile silos at a time when Ukraine faced a very uncertain economic future? And the United States, we said, you know, we can answer that question. Uh, we have the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program that was originally the brainchild of uh, Senators uh, Luger and Nunn, that the U.S. government will fund that. Right. Uh, the second question they had was, well, the nuclear warheads contain highly enriched uranium. That has economic value. Uh, how does Ukraine claim that? And we worked out an arrangement between Russia and Ukraine uh, whereby Russia would provide to Ukraine an equivalent amount of low enriched uranium in fuel rods for Ukrainian nuclear power plants uh, to, to compensate for the highly enriched uranium that was then sent back to Russia in the warheads. Basically, Russians would take the highly enriched uranium, they would blend it down and form that into fuel rods. So that was worked out. Uh, but I think the biggest question was Ukraine said, look, nuclear weapons confer a certain degree of security. What's our security guarantee, our security assurance that the weapons are gone? Uh, and that was, we thought, resolved in 1994 with the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances, in which uh, the United States, Russia, and Britain committed to respect Ukraine's sovereignty, its uh, territorial integrity, its independence, and committed not to use force or threaten to use force against Ukraine. Uh, now, the Ukrainians asked us, and I was I participated in these negotiations. The Ukrainians asked us, "What will you Americans do if the Russians violate these commitments?" Yeah, and we said the United States will take an, we will take an interest. Uh, we will do things. Now we made clear we're not going to send American forces to defend you, uh, but we said we'll do other things. And I think what we've done over the last two years is is basically consistent uh, with right. the uh, things that we told the Ukrainians. And, and, and I think people may not remember, but in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine had on its territory the world's third largest nuclear arsenal. Yeah. Uh, almost 1,900 strategic nuclear warheads that were designed, built, deployed to strike American cities. And I'd say for the Bush administration and early on for the Clinton administration, at the top of their priorities for the first Soviet space was making sure that you could reduce those nuclear weapons and not have the collapse of the Soviet Union lead to multiple nuclear weapon states. Right. So it was a big deal, uh, you know, and we we made that commitment. Um, you know, I think at the time in 1994, certainly we, and when I say we, I'm talking about we Americans, but also our Ukrainian counterparts, we collectively did not foresee what the Russians did in 2014 when they seized Crimea. Right. And certainly not what they did in 2022 when they launched this massive invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, and it's especially interesting then, you know, while you were the ambassador to Ukraine, representing the United States, um, you know, what was the relationship with Ukraine like? And, you know, could you see, um, you know, obviously, I guess Putin was just coming up yeah. in the political system there. Could you see, you know, did you have any idea about the, what the relationship with Putin could be like with the U.S. and Ukraine, I guess? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, well, the nuclear issue when I got there was largely resolved. So it was basically implementation. I mean, you know, the Ukrainians by 1996 had sent all the warheads back to Russia for elimination. And the Ukrainians told us that they'd worked out procedures whereby they were confident that the warheads were eliminated, not simply placed into, you know, uh, the Russian arsenal. Um, and, and we are then still destroying missiles and missile silos and, and, and bombers uh, pursuant to the ag agreement from the Lisbon Protocol. Um, 
and, and so my focus really in the U.S.-Ukraine relationship was on we were trying to help Ukraine basically reform to develop a, a strong market economy um, and, and also to put in the institutions to basically underpin a, a strong democratic state. And in that case, I think in Ukraine, we were assisted in part because you had a very active civil society. Yeah. This was, to my mind, a huge difference between Russia and Ukraine is that, you know, Ukrainians, and you saw this in the Orange Revolution in 2004, you saw it in the Maidan Revolution, the Ukrainians want to have a political voice. They want to have a democratic say. And you really haven't seen that kind of bottom-up pressure from Russians. Yeah. Or when you have, it's been pretty limited and then very much contained by an autocratic system. But so those were the sorts of the issues we were working on. Um, at the time, I mean, there were issues, there were difficult issues between Moscow and Kyiv, but they were largely managed. So, for example, uh, the Ukrainians had, and Russians had agreed in 1997 that Russia could lease facilities on the Crimean Peninsula uh, to accommodate the Black Russian Black Sea Fleet and its supporting elements. Mm -hmm. you know, there were some trade tensions, things like that. Um, and uh, Vladimir Putin uh, became president, uh, well, at the beginning of 2000. And so it was during my last eight months in Ukraine. Yeah. I, I think the Ukrainians were a little bit uncertain about Putin. I mean, they had gotten used to Boris Yeltsin. And, and Yeltsin, I mean, certainly had his flaws as the president of Russia. But Yeltsin was very good from the Ukrainian point of view on one thing, is Yeltsin accepted Ukraine as a sovereign independent state within its borders uh, at 1991, which included Crimea. Yeah. Uh, and there was some uncertainty about Putin, although I can't say that in 2000 that my Ukrainian colonel parts were expressing the kinds of concern that Putin would do what he you know, went on to do in right. 2014 and 2022. Yeah, I mean, that's was there a point when you first started to realize that, hey, something is happening here, this could be a, a problem um, between Russia and Ukraine? Yeah, I, I, I think the, fir uh, the, the first real sign that, and, and Putin, I think, wanted to have a relationship with the West, but he wanted the relationship on Russian terms. Right, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and let me say, I mean, when I look at the, the breakdown in U.S.-Russian relations, which I really think began around 2003, 2004, I think Washington bears some responsibility. Sure. Um, but I would say the bulk of the responsibility lies with Moscow. Right. Uh, Moscow's desire to have to be accepted by the West, but in the terms that the Russians wanted, which is a, you know, accept us as an autocratic state yeah. with their <laughs> human rights issues, but also accept us as a state entitled to a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space regardless of what those other countries in the post-Soviet space were not, want, want, want to do. Right. And, and so I think those are the tensions. But And you saw this, I think, come out, Putin, in um, 2007, basically, uh, at the Munich Security Conference, gave a speech where he kind of boiled over with a bunch of grievances against the West. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, I, I, a couple of the grievances, I, 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 th I think um, there are some things that the Bush administration might have done that perhaps could have answered some Russian concerns, but but some of the things that the Russians wanted simply, you know, we're, we were not going to accommodate. I mean, we're not prepared to sort of compromise our approach to countries like Ukraine or Kazakhstan and say, look, we we can't deal with you as a sovereign and independent state because you're in this so-called Russian sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is interesting because you know, obviously uh, when it comes to diplomatic relations in general between countries, um, there's always little things that can cause bigger issues if they're not taken care of. And it makes sense that, you know, U.S. policy obviously is never going to be perfect. And some of those yeah. sort of issues can can cause bigger problems when you're dealing with regimes that are highly sensitive or, you know, have a have an ambition that they're looking to put in place some way or somehow. So that's very hard to navigate that. Yeah. I, and I think the other problem, too, is, I mean, the relationship between Washington and Moscow and this goes back to Soviet times, probably goes back 60 years, but it really, I believe, is dependent on attention and focus from the people at the top. Yeah. Uh, you had that during the second term of the uh, Reagan administration. You had it during the George H.W. Bush administration. I think Clinton engaged um, Yeltsin. You had it for the first couple of years of the George W. Bush-Putin relationship, so 2001 to 2003, 
But I think in 2003, the two presidents got distracted. And President Bush became preoccupied with Iraq. Uh, Putin became preoccupied with reordering the domestic system within Russia in a more autocratic way. And you had some drift there. I, mean, I began to see this when I was during my last year in the government before I retired in 2004, began to see this drift because there wasn't the focus from above. Uh, and I think uh, as that drift began, frustrations built up on both, both sides. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, there was there were some opportunities there that were missed, perhaps, to address some concerns that might have, you know, extended the possibility of sort of having a better relationship. But I think by 2007, you know, Putin mentally was in a fairly negative place about the West. There was, you know, of course, the the co first couple of years of the Obama administration, the reset. Uh, um, I think uh, reset is now seen as a negative term, yeah, yeah. <laughs> although I would actually argue that reset, if you look at what was accomplished under the, under the term from 2009 to 2011, we got the New START Treaty. The Russians became very helpful in Afghanistan, including letting the United States move uh, lethal military uh, uh, equipment through Russian territory, direct fights across Russia to Afghanistan. Uh, Russia was fairly helpful on Iran, um, and and the United States was doing things like helping uh, Russia get, you know, move towards the uh, the World Trade Organization. Right. Um, I think what happened in 2011, of course, is Vladimir Putin came back to the Russian presidency. Yeah. And 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 Putin bought a set of grievances uh, that made it more difficult to continue the reset. So maybe had the administration, the Obama administration in 2011 said, well, reset's done. We're moving on to something else. Right. Uh, but it certainly, I think, it was fairly clear by the end of 2012, early 2013, that you weren't going to achieve much more with Vladimir Putin, uh, that it was going to be a question, can you manage the relationship and keep things from deteriorating? Of course, in 2014, you saw the uh, the uh, Russian seizure of Crimea. That was, um, I mean, I think, and actually, uh, uh, with Fiona Hill, who was a colleague at Brookings, we actually wrote an article, I think, in January of 2014, saying that um, once the Sochi Winter Olympics are over in February, we thought that the Russian uh, Russia would settle some scores that it had, particularly with Ukraine. Wow. Now, our expectation, while well, we, we said there might be a possibility of stirring up some trouble in Crimea, but I think our main expectation was that Russia would use economic levers, you know, raising the price of energy that it provided to Ukraine, perhaps banning the import of uh, of some goods from Ukraine, things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, Putin went uh, to the extreme route uh, and used military force to take Crimea. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because... Um... I remember that incident pretty well. I was actually in St. Petersburg at the time when uh -huh. that happened. Uh, my father's a, a Russian historian. And so we were just doing a little trip there. Um, we were kind of going around like a little Baltic cruise kind of with Estonia, Finland, uh -huh. St. Petersburg. And I remember seeing it on the news on like BBC in the hotel room. And the same day, if you go to, if you went to like a, a Russian souvenir store there in St. Petersburg, they had t-shirts already printed out with Crimea with a Russian flag over it. Yeah. It was unbelievable just to see how like, you know, how much they were planning this um in society there. You know, so from that at that point, what what's going through your head then when it comes to the future of Russian American and Ukrainian relations? Well, you know, I mean, this is blatant use of military force to to take territory. And I, I think in looking at this, and it's become even more clear since 2022 is I, I think there's several factors behind why the Kremlin launched the major assault in 2022. But I think the main factor, and it also plays out back in 2014, is Vladimir Putin is basically a new imperialist. Uh, yeah. He is trying to recover. And he talks about Ukraine, and you can find this in the last, go back to his, um, that major article he wrote in the summer of 2021. Yes. Yep. Look at his speech on February 21 of 2022, three days before the all-out invasion. Um, this is somebody who fundamentally does not accept Ukraine's right to exist as a sovereign independent state. Right. And he talks about this as sort of recovering historic Russian lands. Yes, yes. So he's basically trying to grab back some parts of the of what was the Russian Empire that Russia lost when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. 
irrespective of the fact that the Ukrainian people have long made clear that they want to pursue their own course. That And, and that's, I think, applies for a large number of ethnic Russians in Ukraine as well as ethnic Ukrainians. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that has been, uh, you know, so obvious, it seems to me, when it comes to the the motives of this conflict uh, when, when it was Putin, because he's, you know, literally created the sources. They're right there in front of everyone to read um, about his ambition uh, with yeah. Ukraine. So it is it is crazy, uh, you know, how uh, it was international political discourse that people could could see some other other reason for what's going on. Uh, and, and, I mean, here's really the irony. If you go back to 2013, Russia had a neutral Ukraine. Yep. Then President Yanukovych had made clear that he did not want to join NATO. He did not want a membership action plan. He would cooperate with NATO, but he had no ambitions to join NATO. Uh, Ukraine's parliament, the Rada, in fact, had voted through a law in 2010 saying Ukraine shall have non bloc status. Right. And if you'd taken an opinion poll in 2012 or 2013, you know, maybe 15 percent of Ukrainians would have said they want to join NATO. What happened, though, was while Yanukovych didn't want to join NATO, he did want to bring Ukraine closer to the European Union. Yeah. And in the summer of 2013, he, they basically completed an association agreement. Now, up until 2010, the Russians said, we don't care what Ukraine does with the European Union. In the summer of 2013, the Russians decided that they cared. And so they began threatening Yanukovych and saying, if you sign the association agreement, you know, there will be economic consequences. We will you know, jack up energy prices. We will prohibit the import of some Ukrainian goods into Russia. We'll mess yep. with your economy. And they also dangled in to Yanukovych some large, low-interest loans. A and the Russians succeeded as they persuaded Yanukovych not to sign the association agreement. That was announced in the afternoon and one day in November. That night, the, the Maidan revolution began. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the irony here is, I mean, it was had the Russians let Yanukovych go forward with the association agreement and and work with the European Union, you might have avoided all of this. Right. No, definitely. I mean, that yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, I'm curious then, you know, given your expertise with you know nuclear weapons and arms control, you know, what do you what should the U.S. make of you know recent nuclear threats from the Russian government regarding Ukraine? Yeah, I, this is where I guess. I mean, when you talk to people in the administration, uh, and this goes back really to the you know, early 2022, they said there's two goals. One is to support Ukraine. The other is to avoid a direct NATO-Russian military clash. And, and those are the right two goals. Right. Where I would be critical of the administration, I think in, in finding the balance between those goals, they've been overly cautious. Yeah. So if you look at nuclear threats, and I think in this case, the, the person to pay attention to is Vladimir Putin. He really peaked on the nuclear threats back in September of 2022. And at that point, he denounced the annexation of Zaporizhia, Kherson, Luhansk, and Donetsk. And he gave a speech where he said, these are Russian territory. We will defend them with all means at our disposal. And I think he was trying to signal the Ukrainians, don't fight for this. This is now Russian territory. Right. The Ukrainians already see this as an existential fight. That didn't change, so it had no impact on the Ukrainians. Uh, I think Putin was hoping it might have an impact on the West. The West basically said, we're going to continue to help the Ukrainians, and if you Russians should use nuclear weapons against Ukraine, there will be catastrophic consequences, full stop. Let the Russians try to figure out what that would be. But then I think you also had the Chinese, the Indians, and others from the global South, countries that matter to Russia, saying, don't do this. And, and you actually, then, if you look at the end of October, uh, Putin really tries to dampen, and this October 2022, tries to dampen down the rhetoric. So he goes to the Valdai Discussion Club. He's asked about these threats. And he says, we don't make threats. Th that's not our policy. Read our doctrine. He said, this is just the West trying to tarnish Russia's good name. And then a week later, the Russian foreign ministry comes out with a statement out of nowhere on prevention of nuclear war, which would be 95% of what we in the West would want to see. Uh, and then a few weeks after that, um, the foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, is in Bali at the G20 summit. He's there because Putin would not travel there. And he signs on a language uh, that, among other things, says 
know, we agree, the G20 agree that use or threats of nuclear weapon are inadmissible and unacceptable. So I, I think the Russians understood that the nuclear threats in the fall of 2022, A, were not working, and B, were causing concern on the parts of people you know, in, in China and India. So they lowered the rhetoric. Uh, and yeah. last year, I mean, uh, over the court, you, you you still see some people, you know, voice rhetoric. I mean, Sergei Karaganov has gone, you know, almost insane on some of his rants about this. Um, but, you know, I, I had a chance in the Trap 2 conversation about two months ago to talk to a Russian. And the Russian basically said, and this is a guy who, you know, former military officer, he made the comedy says, you know, when you're looking at the nuclear rhetoric, goes, pay attention to Vladimir Putin. Don't listen to anybody else. Yeah, I mean, that that makes sense. You would think he would be the the main person <laughs> that <clears throat> everything depends on, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I think that these other folks are probably allowed to make, you know, again, these things, that, yeah, which I I mean, you know, Karaganov has sort of suggested, well, we, we should use some nuclear weapons against Europe. That'll then reinstill a fear of nuclear deterrence in them. Uh, and, and, and what was interesting was when Karaganov first came out with this article, within a couple of days, how many other Russian authors came out and said, this is crazy. <laughs> um, uh, so, but I, I think the, the Russians want to sort of keep that there to make the West a little bit nervous, you know, but, but again, you know, we, we need to understand that uh, the nuclear weapons, it, it's a card the Russians tried to play. Um, it, you know, it didn't work. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think the Kremlin is fairly sober when it comes to nuclear weapons. Yeah, I think that's one thing people tend to sort of exaggerate. I think people tend to underestimate the rationality when it comes to something like nuclear weapons When it with authoritarian nations. Um, I think people <clears throat> kind of tend to think that everything operates in, in, in such a vacuum that they'll do anything. But that's kind of also their game plan. They want you to be a little uncertain about what they're going um, to do to get perhaps what they want if they can. Yeah, yeah, but 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 on the other hand, I I think also that uh, that there are those in 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 Moscow who understand that actual Russian use of nuclear weapons opens up a Pandora's box. Yeah, of course. And at that point, you've changed the rules of the game, and you then do not know what will happen. Right. Yeah, that's right. It becomes so unpredictable that they can't. They don't know what's going to happen next. So that's yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes perfect sense as well. So what do you think then? is the future of uh, U.S. foreign policy with Russia and Ukraine. What should be the future of U.S. foreign policy then, given the situation today? Yeah, um, well, I'm fairly strongly of the view that the United States should continue to support Ukraine. Um, I, I, and I, I think that's, and that's not just because what Ukraine did 30 years ago in getting rid of the nuclear weapons that were sure. a big priority for us. But I, I think the U.S. has for more than seven decades now said we have a vital national interest in a stable and secure Europe. Uh, if the Russians win, Europe is not going to be stable. It's not going to be secure. Right. And uh, he here's my concern, which is that I don't know how far Vladimir Putin's ambitions extend. Uh, but he's talked about recovering historic Russian lands. If you look at a map of the Russian Empire in the late 19th century, you'll see that the Baltic states, Finland, a, bar a big part of Poland, were part of the Russian, R Russian Empire. Yeah. Now... I, I wouldn't say that there's, I, I, I think if if Putin prevails in Ukraine, if there's a win there, I think he becomes emboldened. Yeah, I, yeah, I it makes sense. That means more risk, for example, to Moldova. But I also think it may mean more risk to, say, the Baltic states. Now, is there a high probability that, you know, Putin would launch an attack on a NATO member? You know, maybe not, but it's certainly not zero. Yeah. And if you'd ask people like me uh, or other analysts, say, five years ago, could you foresee what Putin did in February 2022? We would all say no chance. I mean, he's not that reckless. Right. So I, I think we should not underestimate Vladimir Putin's ambitions. If we do so, there's a risk. And so what I look at this and saying, look, in the case of Ukraine, we're sending weapons, we're sending money, but there are no American soldiers fighting in Ukraine. You know, if Putin should win in Ukraine and decides that Eastern Estonia is next on the list, we're going to be sending American troops. It's better to stop Putin in Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I, I agree. That makes perfect sense. I mean, also, it's just, you know, when you think about if someone is successful, I think historically, you know, any any person 
intended on conquest tends to kind of search for more after they've had a victory. So, I mean, that just seems like a, a pattern that you'd want to avoid. Um, plenty of examples, obviously, of, of people, you know, once they get one place, like, okay, what can we turn our attention to next now that we've accomplished this goal? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, the amount of money that we're spending is is probably, what, 6 to 7% of the American defense budget. Right. Russell's proclaimed uh, the, the United States, it's, it's sort of its number one enemy. Um, that money is basically, I think, doing huge damage to the Russian war machine. Yeah. Um, so we're not only helping Ukraine defend itself, but we're also having an impact, you know, on a country which has said it's our adversary. Uh, so it, it just seems to me that this is a case where the U.S. nationalism is very clear. I think we should also ask ourselves, if the United States ends support for Ukraine, what message does that send to other countries in the world? I mean, yeah. what does China conclude? I mean, China concludes that yep. well, in the case of Taiwan, the Americans might be interested for 20 months, 22 months, but after that, they're going to get tired and go home. You know, it's a really bad message. Yeah, I mean, I imagine there's plenty of countries that kind of look to this conflict as an example of what how they should proceed with perhaps their territorial ambitions. Um, yeah, China and Taiwan. Um, obviously, I think, you know, as of late, the what Azerbaijan and Armenia situation becomes is something that seems like it could be interesting in the near future, potentially, yeah. again, if something doesn't get done in terms of a deal. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's kind of something that has been uh, one of the main aspects of preventing conflict in the world is the idea that the United States actually cares about what happens. Yeah. Um, and with Ukraine, if Ukraine gets conquered by Russia, then it kind of looks like the U.S. does not care. Yeah, yeah. I, so I think we have a national interest in seeing that Ukraine succeeds. And again, you know, I, I think there's also a moral case to be made. Uh, the reflection of Ukraine, the victim of unjustified aggression. Now, of course, you know, we can't respond in every case around the world that. But, you know, an argument can be made that uh, Ukraine merits a certain amount of consideration from us for the fact that, you know, they, they, they might have made a different choice. They might have chosen to try to keep some nuclear weapons back in the 1990s. Right. And I think that would have been a complication for U.S. policy. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, how much of your experience, you know, based on your experience in Russia, you know, do you have much idea of, of how uh, sort of Russian officials that may not be as high up, you know, as close to Putin, how, what they were, what they thought when this first yeah. happened? Um, you know, anecdotally, I, this secondhand, I mean, uh, I, I don't have a lot of contact with Russian officials. I've sure. been on, I mean, I, 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 I when they when the ban list came out in 2022, I was on it. I'd actually been told I would been I would been I was banned from Russia back in 2015 or 2016. Okay. <laughs> so so you know it, it, it's probably not uh, uh, I, I'm not on the um, the uh, the Christmas card list of many Russian officials. Yes. But I've heard third hand that some Russian officials were actually quite upset by what happened in 2022. Yeah. Um, that they and I think these were officials who understood that this was going to be uh, you know a a a a a disaster for russia and i would argue that in in, in 2021 i would have said russia is a country in decline uh, you know fairly stagnant economy uh demographically in trouble um a pretty brittle political system right um i think this war has accelerated that decline uh i mean if you look at it militarily uh the 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 numbers that I've seen, which I think are probably accurate, are three hundred fifty thousand Russian soldiers killed or are wounded in action. Yeah, um, sixty percent of Russian main battle tanks either destroyed or captured. Uh, I think the Russian military uh, reputation is in tatters. Um, you know, some some wag once said that uh, Russia has gone from the second most powerful military in uh, the world the second most powerful military in ukraine that, that's that's of course an exaggeration but sure. then the russian military if you looked at the comparison of the russian military to the ukrainian military you know most people thought including me thought that this would be militarily a, a walkover for the russians my own expectation was that the russians would then face a decades-long bloody insurgency fight so i think it's been a military disaster Economically, although I, I give the Russian government credit, they have managed the consequences of sanctions. But you know, Putin said that their economy grew by three percent in 2023. That's I think almost all attributed to the fact 
that they have done this huge increase in defense spending. Uh, and there's real questions of whether that's going to be sustainable in the future. Uh, there, meanwhile, I, they are getting cut off, uh, although the West needs to close some loopholes from, from high-tech uh, trade, things like that. So I, I think it's been, you know, economically, I think it's been a setback. Right. I mean, geopolitically, it's been a disaster. You have NATO now re-energized. More NATO members are committed, uh, are, are meeting the 2% standard of 2% of gross domestic product devoted to defense. NATO will, uh, th there'll be a greater presence of NATO military forces in Poland, the Baltic states, because of this concern about Russia. And you had sweet, you know, Finland and Sweden asked to join NATO. Finland is now in. I believe Sweden will be in within a few months. So I, I think if you took a Russian and sent them back in a time machine to 2013, yes, and said this is where Russia is going to be in 2024. You know, this war, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands dead and injured. Uh, you, it'll it'll take the Russian military years and years to replace what they've lost. You know, we've now turned the Baltic uh, Sea into a NATO lake. Uh, NATO's rearming. Uh, the economy is going to be uh, hindered. They would say, what a disaster, you know, how did we fall into this? Well, Vladimir Putin made a really bad blunder with this decision to uh, launch this all out war. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I was I was going to say. I was going to say the, the historical memory of, of Russians, you know, eventually is not going to be very good of this conflict, you would think, um, considering um, all the consequences of, of such an action. So, yeah, I, I, and, I and I think it's um, yeah. And, and the consequences will be long term. Right. I mean, this is where I look at. I mean, the U.S. Russia relationship, and this personally, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not. I don't take any satisfaction in this because I've probably spent close to half my career in the foreign service trying to get to better relations between Washington and Moscow. But I don't see a anything like a normal relationship between Washington and Moscow until a couple of things happen. And I would say more broadly between the West and Russia. One is, I think Vladimir Putin has to leave the Kremlin. It's yeah. how does a Western leader now? sit down with Putin right, with, yeah. with the blood on his hands, and he's an indicted war criminal by the International Criminal Court. And then second, whoever comes in behind him, that person has to adopt some policy changes to suggest that you know Russia is prepared to deal in a very different way with its neighbors. But until you get to that point, it seems to me that you know, it's going to be a very difficult relationship between the West and Russia. You know, When people talk about European security structures, I, I was at a a meeting uh, a few months back where we talked about this, uh, the European security structure, which in the 70s, 80s was designed to include Russia, is now being developed. It will be designed to contain and keep Russia out. Yeah. And it'll be years until you get back to a situation where people are talking about a cooperative security structure with Russia, because at this point in time, the Russians don't seem to be prepared uh, to cooperate in those security terms. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'll, we'll just have to hope for the best in, in terms of that situation, because uh, yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to be anything good for the foreseeable future. Um, just wrapping up then, you know, what are you currently working on? Well, I, I, I would still like to do a little bit or see something on, on our nuclear arms control. And, and I, I work on that in Russia, Ukraine. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm part of a group that we've, we've tried to... Um, Quietly encourage the administration to do a bit more for Ukraine. I I, I think the the administration has been supportive of Ukraine, uh, but I think they, they they could and should be doing more. Right. And, and on things like providing additional weapons. Now, part of this is an issue with the Congress, and there we have I think unfortunately the question of assistance for Ukraine is getting entangled in American domestic politics. I hope that will be sorted out, and I think at the end of the day, it will be sorted out. But because I believe that. You know, both in the Senate and the House, you have a fairly strong bipartisan majority that supports Ukraine. Right. You know, so the question is, can they get to the vote that, that would allow that to happen? Um, so there, I, I, I would like to I mean, do a little bit of thinking about, you know, what happens between, well, while well, the focus now for the West should be on getting Ukraine the weapons and the ammunition that Ukraine needs, either to drive the Russians out or at a minimum, to achieve enough success on the battlefield where they can negotiate a settlement that Ukraine's government and Ukraine's people can accept. Right. Um, but longer term, it seems to me that, you know, the security situation is such in Europe that, and, and this has been an evolution in my own thinking, 
uh, that we need to think in a more serious way about bringing Ukraine into NATO. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, I think it you know, there will be a NATO summit in July in Washington. It'll, among the things, mark the 75th anniversary of the founding of NATO. Um, and I think it, it, it's too early at that to uh, expect a NATO consensus on extending the invitation to Ukraine to join the alliance. But uh, I, I argued in a paper for Brookings uh, last uh, month that what NATO should be doing is launching a session talks. Right, so yeah. talks with Ukraine with an early view to extending the invitation at some point down the road, uh, which I think would be a valuable signal, both in terms of assuring Ukraine that there's a West a place for the Ukrainians in the European security structure, but also sending a message to Moscow that NATO support for Ukraine will endure. Uh, so I've been working on that. Uh, on the arms control side, unfortunately, while I, I, there are ideas out there, I think... Um, at this point in time, although there are, I believe, people in Moscow who see value to arms control, uh, Vladimir Putin has come to this conclusion that uh, he wants to punish the West, and one way to punish the West is by uh, basically make you know undoing arms control. So, for example, a year ago, Putin announced that uh, Russia would suspend the new strategic arms reductions treaty now the russians quickly clarified that russia will continue to observe the numerical limits right how they were suspending the data exchanges the notifications the inspections and well i think uh, there, there are three basic limits in the new start treaty numerical limits two of them you can probably monitor with national technical means things like reconnaissance satellites but the most important limit to my mind is the limit on deployed strategic warheads and that becomes harder to have confidence that the other side's observing that limit if you don't have notifications and inspections. And then you had this kind of bizarre thing that the that Putin did back in the fall where uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Now, here's where the United States cannot brag. I mean, we've signed the treaty, but we've never been able to ratify it. Sure. And it was signed 27, 28 years ago. Russia ratified the treaty, but Putin then said, well, we're going we're gonna to withdraw our ratification. <laughs> You know, it, it doesn't mean anything because as a signatory to the treaty, Russia still has an obligation not to take actions inconsistent with the treaty. But I think, again, it was Putin trying to sort of shake up the arms control regime. And so if that's going to be the prevailing attitude in Moscow, uh, I worry that arms control, which I think is in both the American and the Russian interest, is going to have a, a difficult period of coming ahead. And my guess is we're likely to end up in a an arms race with both Russia and China for several years. I don't think that's a happy prospect, but no. <laughs> reality. And then hopefully before too long, we recall the lessons that we learned back in the 1960s, which is at some point piling more nuclear weapons on top of our arsenal doesn't buy us any security if the guys other guys are doing the same thing. Yeah. And finding our ways back to you know the arms control dialogue that you know might. Uh, make things a bit more stable and secure and less expensive for everyone. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you're going to have plenty of stuff to write about then for the foreseeable future, I think. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, again, I, I I wish I could write be writing a little bit more about success on, on, on yeah, both the right. and on arms control, but we'll see. Yeah, hope for the best. And yeah. uh, what's the best way for people to follow your work? Um, well, I... Uh, Either at the, uh, if you go to what the, the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford, they have a news page, uh, which which publishes all of my articles, uh, and you can also go to um, uh, the, the Brookings Institution, where I'm a non-resident senior fellow, and you look at Piper at Brookings, and they also have a list of uh, all of my articles there as well in chronological order. Perfect, and you're also I'm on. Al I'm also on Twitter, uh, yeah. which sometimes is you know not the best thing, but. <laughs> Well, that's life. <laughs> that's right. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on and sharing all of your knowledge on you know such a critical issue today. So, thank you for having me.